The third largest American naval base in the world is in Jacksonville, and it's under new leadership. Commanding Officer Gregory DeWitt joins us to explain the importance to our region and the Navy. Plus, the naval aviator is breaking barriers, and we'll share his thoughts on making history. Chris Hand is with us for our Hand on Government segments. The state of Florida and Disney reaching a deal on their lawsuits. The federal government passing a budget, but we can see other funding fights on the horizon. And city council takes a concrete step toward the Jaguars stadium renovation. We'll talk through all of that on This Week in Jacksonville. And thanks for joining us today. So we're focused on those important local, state, and federal policy issues in a moment. First, though, very excited to welcome the new commanding officer at Naval Air Station Jacksonville. This is Captain Gregory DeWint. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank um, you for having me. So I know you've been in Jacksonville already a little while serving as executive officer there at NES Jax, but uh, took command in February. Tell us about, yeah. I guess, some of your background, and then we want to get into what the installation means to the Navy, national security, all of that kind of stuff. Well, okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, it was on February 29th when uh, I took over as commanding officer, and I've been there since, oh, I want to say it was August of 2022. Uh, so it's been a, a wonderful uh, yeah, experience coming from there. We've, we've got some video of a change of command ceremony here. Yes. Um, that had to be really stirring, right? I mean, I, I know you've gone through promotion ceremonies, that kind of thing, but what did this mean to you uh, back there on February 29th? This is a milestone, uh, an absolute milestone, because when have been in this for going on 33 years now, wow. and coming from being an enlisted member uh, and being in a, a coffee mess of a squadron, and now the, to be in charge of the third largest naval installation that we have in the U.S., uh, is just inspiring. It's a milestone I had not even thought of being a part of, uh, but a lot of blessings, a lot of mentors that uh, uh, guided me yeah. uh, to be here. Yeah, this is really cool. So I, I know a lot of your careers, I was looking through your biography there, a lot of that was spent west. So I saw either San Diego or Hawaii, you've had tours at sea. Uh, let me ask about this, you're a naval aviator. That's and, correct. And which of those assignments was maybe most intense or most interesting, however you would characterize it? Oh, wow. There was probably something uh, in all of them, I would say. Uh, prior to this, uh, I was the, uh, worked at Navy Personnel Command where every bit of paper goes through the Navy. <laughs> so that was uh, amazing just to be able to see that. I guess they see behind the curtain a little bit. Prior to that was my squadron uh, tour. Well, actually, before that was with uh, Strike Group 1, or Carl Vinson. So being on a deck of an aircraft carrier, uh, just where naval power uh, is projected from. That's the focus of uh, our, our, that's the focus of naval, uh, yeah. naval aviation, so to speak. Uh, before that was my squadron tour in San Diego, uh, HSM-49, the Scorpions. I have to give a shout out to them. That was a, also a milestone tour. So I think every tour that I've had, has been a stepping stone to something, uh, another opportunity, another blessing that's just been provided for me. So there's not just, there's not just one. Yeah, that I can I, pull out. I, I'm sure over almost 33 years, there's probably a, a lot in there. And, and Captain, you're you're a pioneer in this regard. You're the first Black American man to assume command of this naval base. Not lost on me that that your promotion happened there uh, during Black History Month, by the way. What does this mean to you? And and let's talk further on that. But what is that? kind of title that that uh, that you step into that kind of promotion what does that mean to you uh, well uh, first I would like to say that uh, I was selected for Jacksonville for qualifications sure. um, yeah it's because of my career and uh, and recognized by by peers and leaders senior leaders said hey we're gonna select uh, Greg to be uh, a commanding officer for this installation uh, I happen to be the first uh, black American, um, and that in and of itself is, is an honor and privilege. Uh, interestingly enough, yesterday I was sitting down in our, in our mess hall, so to speak, our essential station messing, and a sailor came up to me and said, you know, I have never seen uh, a captain here among the troops before. And he also said, much less a black captain. So to me, that was the culmination of just being able to be there and be an inspiration, uh, to be a role model for younger sailors, to show them that there is a career, there is a path ahead for you. Um, 
as senior leaders, we, we want the Navy to be a, a career option, a career of choice for individuals. How amazing is that, that one sailor walking in says, I have a future. Yeah. There's something I can, I can do here. Well, and it speaks a bit to the difference in the uh, armed forces in America where it's a volunteer service, where you make choices. I want to be involved, or I want to make it even a career for me. Speaks to that for sure. Uh, part of my research here says Samuel Gregory Jr. really set the bar. The last century, he was uh, the first black man to serve on a fighting ship as an officer, first to command a Navy ship, first fleet commander, first flag officer. He retires as a vice admiral, but he passed some 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is there inspiration that comes from seeing someone that? Were you that young sailor that came to you yesterday? Were you at that point sometime? I, I can achieve that. I can achieve that. Um, I think it, it goes, it ebbs and flows. Uh, when you don't see individuals higher up or another rank, you always wonder, hey, what, what are my limits? What can I do? Where's my ceiling? Wow. Is there, is there a ceiling? Um, yeah, I'm going to pull from a peer of mine also, uh, Captain Janet Days, who's up in Norfolk uh, as the first black American woman to be in charge of Norfolk Naval Base. Uh, she was asked a similar question and said, what does it be like to be the first? Uh, and her response, very apt, it means she won't be the last. And so I have to borrow from that saying, like it means I won't be the last. That's uh, awesome. We are inspiring junior sailors, uh, junior officers to say, you can achieve more yeah. with what you're doing. It, Captain, uh, talk about this a little bit. I, and if you're not a military member, you may not realize this, but you referenced it a moment. NAS Jack's the third largest Navy base uh, in the world for you, you, the United States Navy. Uh, what's involved in serving first as EXO and now commanding officer? And what does this installation mean to national security for America? Uh, that's a great question. Um, first, as executive officer, it's amazing to have been that because my background was in flying. You can ask me about helicopters, I can tell you yeah. about that, that's great. So having that time as executive officer helped me to understand what it is that's involved in an installation because it's not so much just giving direction. It's more about working with individuals and uh, not so much managing personalities, but how can we find a way to get to, we like to say, how do we get to yes? What obstacles have to be overcome? So I spent my time as executive officer going through that. And now as commanding officer, it's expanding those relationships. Jacksonville has a great partnership, uh, NAS Jacksonville, with the community of Jacksonville. Uh, so doing more for the installation, for the, the, the partners that we have in the community, uh, say here's, what, here's how we are expanding uh, on the base. Uh, you asked about national security. We have uh, five helicopter squadrons, seven P-8 squadrons, uh, all about doing reconnaissance, any surface warfare, any submarine warfare. They're going out being part of the, uh, the, the strike groups, those carrier strike groups. Uh, our, our P-8s are also doing aerial reconnaissance um, and even more some missions that I right. can't necessarily can't disclose. tell me about, okay. Uh, <laughs> but all, all to advance national uh, security, national interest. The other great part about Jacksonville is that it's a growing industrial base. So we have uh, uh, a, a, not just a logistics center that handles the Southeast region, but also repair uh, uh, artisans for those P-8s, for the helicopters, for the F-35, that's also gonna be coming there. We have a naval hospital that's also on board the base that serves probably the largest lots and lots veterans of population in the U.S. I believe it's about 140,000, if wow. not more. So uh, Naval Hospital Jacksonville provides that support. Uh, we also provide support. I mentioned community partners. Uh, we have the uh, uh, some of our ball fields go to the or Ortega uh, Little League, so they're also part of that. So, yeah. Um, well, and, and uh, even the casual viewer will know, oh, NES Jax is where every other year I'm seeing the Blue Angels, I'm going out there. Uh, Captain, so we're, we're running out of time, but I love that, that we get to uh, introduce you to the community here, that thank we you. get to uh, have some of your expertise here on the show, and thank you for just sharing from your heart about uh, these career moves. Congratulations 
Uh, welcome to that position. I'm so glad you're in Jacksonville. Thank you very much. And shameless plug, we are having another uh, Blue Angel Air Show this October. Yes, <laughs> in October. There it is. A lot of people will be planning for it right now. Thank, Thank you, you, Captain. Thank you very much. All right, so we're focused on local public policy when we come back. Chris Hand joins me as we look at the, the city's recent steps toward a stadium of the future for the Jaguars. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. And once a month, we take time on our show for what we call Hand on Government because Chris Hand is with us, former chief of staff of the city of Jacksonville, former staffer for governor and then U.S. Senator Bob Graham, uh, also a government law attorney. Let's talk about this big deal that's going on. Jacksonville City Council, the city of Jacksonville, taking a concrete step this week with $10 million set aside that goes towards redevelopment of the Jag the stadium downtown. This is in partnership with Jaguars. Well, first of all, happy Easter, Kent. Uh, and, you know, this is going to be a huge fiscal matter for the city of Jacksonville. Obviously, the Jacksonville Jaguars, our hometown NFL team, have proposed a stadium renovation. They're calling it the Stadium of the Future. That's probably going to cost somewhere around a billion and a half dollars, uh, with that cost to be shared between the city and the Jaguar. So we don't know yet what that cost sharing is going to look like or what the actual price is going to be. But the city council this past weekend took the first steps in a you know very small down payment in the city's ultimate contribution. They allocated $10 million towards stadium design and engineering so the city can begin to get a sense of what the stadium might look like and how much that will cost. Obviously, going forward, it sounds like the Jaguars and the city negotiators are going to present a plan to the city council in May, so, you know, month or month and a half from now. So we'll have a better idea then what this stadium project is going to look like. But the council's made a, again, small down payment uh, toward what could be a significant stadium renovation. Uh, one of the things that they made clear was hey, this just the stadium renovation, not this entertainment district. But it's not like that's off the table. It's just that's down the road. Is that right? It's a matter of sequencing. In other words, so first is going to be the stadium project, which, again, right now the costs of that are looking somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion and a half dollars. Uh, then you take sort of after that the idea of developing the area around the stadium. And as you said, initially, it looked like those were going to be part of one big package. Package. Now it appears they're going to sequence those stadium first, development next. But a lot of these details coming to the city council uh, here in the late spring. Of course, there's still a variety of unanswered questions in this process, even though council's taken this initial step, Kent. Number one is exactly how much is the city yeah. going to have to pay toward the stadium? Yeah. How are they going to pay for that? Are they just going to borrow money? There had been some discussion about using some of the pension funds as an idea. Um, ultimately, what is this going to look like? And, you know, how is the fan experience going to change? Uh, the, under the schedule they're working with now, the renovated stadium would open in August of 2028. So at some point in that process, the Jaguars would have to play elsewhere. And then also, what other infrastructure priorities might this affect? There's been a recommendation to build a new Duval County Jail uh, outside of downtown. There are, of course, lingering infrastructure questions about the unfulfilled promises of consolidation, putting basic infrastructure like paved streets and sidewalks and, you know, switching from septic tanks to central sewer uh, in uh, longtime Jacksonville neighborhoods. So there's a larger infrastructure conversation to be had here, stadium just being one part well, of it. And just briefly, somebody asked me this week, if we do this or when the city does this deal about the Jaguar, the stadium for the Jaguars, is Jacksonville going to be broke or have such reduced uh, income or ability to spend money that some of those things won't happen that really need to? It's an excellent question that I think the city council will need to dive into. What is their financial capacity to do this project and how does it affect the ways you might fund that? One of the trends that we are seeing around the country, Kent, is that after several years of sort of being a wash in money because of a good economy, because of the American Rescue Plan, city and county governments around the country are beginning to feel some contraction. There were some big cities like New York and San Francisco that ran pretty significant deficits that had to be closed this year. And if you look for the next several years on the city's capital improvement program, uh, its budget for items like this, that looks like it's going to shrink in years to come. So that's definitely a major question. How does this fit into the city's overall financial picture? 
Uh, I'm squeezing us on time a little bit on this topic, but I definitely wanted to get to the, it's a state of Florida topic, a settlement reached between Governor Ron DeSantis and Disney and these lawsuits uh, against each other. What do we take out of this? It's about two years this has been going on. Well, that's right. Started two years ago uh, when the legislature passed the so-called Don't Say Gay bill, which Disney criticized. The governor and some allies in the legislature responded to that by abolishing the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which was the essentially self-governing local self government that Disney had to run the area around the parks and places in Central Florida. That was replaced by what's called the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District, which was a new government entity there. And Disney and the state and this, dis this new district had been broiled in legislation in both state and federal court. Well, they've now settled the state court uh, litigation, agreed to work together. And there were probably a couple of steps that helped facilitate this, Kent. One was they made some significant personnel changes at that district. They brought in a new chair who was seen as friendlier to Disney. And in a Northeast Florida connection, they brought in a new executive director, Stephanie Kapalosis, who was the former Florida Secretary County, of Transportation. Right? Yeah. That's right, grew up in Clay County, was the Clay County manager, a lot of experience in local government. Uh, she is now the executive director of that district. So some of those steps, it is thought, helped to pave the way for this settlement. And now is an opportunity. You know, Disney's talking about investing somewhere on the range of $60 billion with a B over the next 10 years in its theme parks and cruises around the world. So with some of this litigation settled, that might open opportunities for some of that investment to occur right in Central Florida. All right, Chris isn't going anywhere. Uh, he's staying with us. And, you know, there's some progress in Washington uh, with a budget agreement. That doesn't mean that the battle over the nation's checkbook is over. Chris and I discuss next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And government law attorney Chris Hand is with us today. So, Chris, let's talk about the federal budget, which finally got pushed through in March, but uh, seems to be a perpetual issue and one that doesn't really seem like these budget battles, they don't really go away just because they've got an agreement now. Well, Ken, I guess if there's a theme here, it's better late than never because, of course, they were finishing the budget bills for the fiscal year that October, started on right? October the 1st. <laughs> wow. So finally have gotten that done halfway through the year. Uh, Senate and House passed a $1.7 trillion budget bill to make sure the federal government's funded through uh, September the 30th. And do I have that? Is it $1.2 trillion? No. $1.7? One, excuse me, $1.2 oh, trillion. Okay. You're All correct. Right. Yeah, through the end of the fiscal year. But as you said, this doesn't mean this is over at this point. That is through September the 30th. Uh, so what that means is the federal government's going to run out of money again right in the middle of the presidential election uh, in September. So we'll have to see what happens. This is also a little bit of a case of, as Yogi Berra might have said, deja vu all over again, because the Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, was able to pass this bill by relying on Democratic votes. Well, the last time a Republican Speaker did that, his name was Kevin McCarthy, yeah. and he was ousted. So perhaps predictably, the day after this passed, uh, a representative from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene, introduced a resolution to uh, vacate the chair and find a new speaker. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah. Let's turn our attention to something else, national side. That's this bridge collapse, the Francis Scott Key bridge collapse in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, certainly here in Jacksonville, that happened, uh, and it brings back some memories, right? Well, first of all, condolences to the families of the workers who lost their lives in that collapse. And also kudos to the first responders who moved very quickly to close off the bridge and prevent further loss of life. It's something that really strikes home here in Florida. Of course, in 1980, we had a ship hit the Sunshine Skyway Bridge over Tampa Bay that collapsed that span at that point. Here in Jacksonville, just over a decade ago, in 2013, we had a ship hit the Matthews Bridge. It didn't collapse it, but it did damage it. Yeah and the bridge was closed for uh, a month. So uh, a lot of, you know, again, the mayor very quickly came out and tried to reassure the public that our bridges here were safe because we are a city of bridges. But, you know, obviously the loss of life is the biggest concern, but there are also going to be significant economic impacts here. The Port of Baltimore is on the other side of that bridge. It's gonna take months to clear the bridge uh, remnants. Uh, it's probably gonna take up to about four years and several hundred million dollars to rebuild the bridge. So there's concerns about 
some of the economic aspects that you know mirror the importance of the port uh, in terms of the Northeast Florida economy as well. And I've been in touch with uh, leaders at Jack's Ports this week. Of course, we know at least one of the ships there in Baltimore is going to be diverted here. Uh, we'll see if there are others, but um, yeah, there's a. There's an issue economically up and down the eastern seaboard now. Well, and WJXT had maritime attorney Rod Sullivan on this week, and he yep. talked about some of those potential diversions to places like Norfolk and Charleston, but also to Jacksonville and Savannah, uh, and you know the main port of Georgia, or another main Georgia port in Brunswick, just north of here. Uh, Baltimore was very much a vehicle port. Uh, Brunswick, in particular, yep. is set up as a vehicle port, so we could see some additional traffic there. But a lot of economic ramifications, but just most importantly, thoughts with those families who lost loved ones, thanks to the first responders uh, and all of the public servants who have responded to this. Baltimore and Jacksonville, very similar cities, um, and uh, very sorry to see that's happened What there. would you say in 30 seconds or less if I asked you about the University of Florida opening a graduate campus in Jacksonville starting in uh, the fall? Well, I would say we, we, there's still some steps to be taken to see if that happens. Uh, obviously, this week, the State Board of Education approved some of those initial plans, but still have to figure out a site, see what a building looks like. So a story we want to continue to monitor as this goes forward. Yeah, so they'll, they'll meet in the JEA building to start just to get those students coming in, but obviously a, a big deal. Always a big deal to have uh, our hand on government segments, too. Chris Hand, thanks so much. Kent, thank you. All right. So, as you know, this weekend, Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. Mayor, Don Mayor Donna Deegan is our guest next week, so certainly join us for that. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17, and then you'll find us online, newsforjax.com, or streaming on News for Jax Plus. And don't forget to check out our podcast, This Week in Jacksonville Business Edition. This week's episode looks at women in leadership and gets the perspective of an Armenian delegation that came to our area just to hear from of the women in leadership in Northeast Florida. Uh, you'll find that every Thursday at 9 a.m. And you can find that anywhere you get your podcast, including on News for Jacks Plus. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jacks, Northeast Florida, South Georgia's number one source for local news.